All right. So, hello everyone and welcome to the session. First of all, thank you for coming. This is important for me that I'm going to share something cool about our socket and, of course, reactive Pac-Man and give you some fun, some session of fun. All right. Let's let me introduce myself. My name is Oleg. I'm from Ukraine. I'm from Kiev. Have you ever been to Ukraine before? Woo! One person. That's success. So. I'm Alec. I work for Netify. This company, we are building the future. We are building reactive streams. We are building our socket. This is company, so I'm, a, I'm core team of our socket. Um, I'm, I love reactive programming at all, so I love it that much. So I started contributing to Project Reactor. Have you ever heard about Project Reactor before? Ooh, a little bit about Rx Java. Just a couple of things, but about reactive programming. I, I'm pretty sure you heard about that concept, right? Great. That's cool. So. Um, I wrote a book about reactive programming in Spring, and this is basically this book. And I'm going to give away one paper book for the most active person in this audience, which will be playing at the, at the Pac-Man game of, game of a course. So uh, let's start about our main topic, about our agenda, and let me clarify what is the main problem of uh, nowadays. We are not going to look at Pac-Man implementation. We are not going to write the code during the whole session. No, we are go not going to do that. The main problem is that we are living in cloud-native era. We are building microservices. How many of you are building microservices or distributed system? Almost everyone, right? This, and we all do network communication between service A, service B, a browser, and any other components in our system. And even though we are going to push the performance of every component to the maximum, we are going to utilize our CPU really well, we still will have the problem of communication. We still will end up with slow communication. If it's slow, we are not going to benefit any, anything from, from the performance of the applications. That's why we're going to look at the network protocol and communication. And we're going to compare during the whole session net different network protocols. And the good sample of comparison between protocols is something real time. And this is basically real time game, multiplayer game where multiple computers involved in the communication. And the real time communication is really required to be low latency and high performance. And of course, you will be involved. You, you are going to get, to get some fun and to have some fun. And you will be required and to, to contribute a little bit in this, in this session by finalizing uh, the best or choosing the best protocol for, for building something real time and high performance. Is it, is it clear? Is it something you, you want to listen to? Yeah? All right, great. So let's start and let's talk a little bit about the requirements for our game. So we want to build a multiplayer game, and the simplest way to give an access to, to this game for everyone is to build it in the browser, right? So we are going to build a browser game, and any browser game requires some server. So we have a server, and the first interaction between client and server is sending a request and receiving an HTML, HTML page. And of course, we want to have some future technologies like server-side push, so we expect that our server is going to push everything that we want to have in our application asynchronously without additional requests from our side. Yeah, does it make sense? Then this, the, the next step, if of course, is of course first interaction. Like I'm gonna, say, I want to say that who am I, and I want to receive the state of a game. So I want to start playing the game, and of course, in order to make it more interactive, I have to send some updates on my map. So I have to say where I am. So this is the simplest implementation that I ended up. So this is really a dumb implementation. I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm saying where I am. So this is basically allocation updates from my client to the server. The same I expect from other clients. So they're going to send updates from their clients through the server, and then server going to send me updates of their location, so I will be able to move uh, all the players and all the characters over my map. Yeah, does it make sense? Simple, but it should work. And finally, in order to make this game kind of competitive, fun, we are gonna, going to introduce to some scoreboard where you have to, where every apartment have to eat some food on the map, on the map, and of course every ghost should should catch a Pac-Man and get some um, some score from that. That's the idea. But uh, the point here is that where is microservices? You have to ask this question: Where is microservices? This is plain browser server communication. Where is my microservices? That's why we are going to introduce a little bit of cruel Java enterprise. And we are going to earn some money for our business. And of course, we are going to introduce some trendy words like machine learning, Kafka, and many others, enterprise things. So the idea is in order to earn money, we're going to collect or spy all the behaviors of our users. And we are going to collect them to Kafka, for example. In any unclear situation, just put Kafka in between and it will work. 
So we are going to do the same because Kafka is basically an elastic storage, so it can handle all the information user do, like movements, behaviors, and so forth and so on. And then we are going to use this information behind the Kafka. We are continuously consume data from Kafka in order to build some machine learning algorithm pipeline model and then sell this model to, I don't know, some huge enterprise and get some money. So this is the idea of the startup. We are going to consume data, gather exam somehow, and then send to final machine learning machine or subscriber where it could be processed really fast or because we are living in distributed system and the main problem of distributed system, you don't know where your servers start working slow, we should expect that at some point it starts working really slow and we have to preserve stability of the system. We have to, to uh, kind of process all the data without any losing because any losemen. Because uh, if we're going to lose something, we're going to um, waste some money and we're going to lose our clients. That's the problem. So we have to preserve stability. All right, let's summarize quickly what I just said. Uh, basically, we have a couple of communication partners like server push, request response, client side streaming, server side streaming. And uh, a part of that, we have some enterprise uh, business model from on top of that game, simple game, multiplayer game like machine learning pipe, which could work fast or slow, but we have to preserve stability of this system because it's important for our business, right? Does it make sense? It should. So let's talk a little bit about toolkit. As I said, I have already implemented something. We're not going to focus on the implementation of code writing. Um, in, this, in this case, I have written uh, our server and our microservices part using Sprint Framework 5. Any Sprint user here? Ooh, we have a couple of Sprint users here. I'm going to use Project Reactor for the reason of high performance, clarity of my functional code and simplicity of building complex transformation of my data within, within my application, within my game server, because it's just a streaming from one to another. So Project Reactor fields fits really well for this use case. I'm going to use Proto Buffer, Protocol Buffer. Any Protocol Buffer users? Have you ever heard about Protocol Buffer before? All right, for those who has never heard about Protocol Buffer before, Protocol Buffer is a message format, like JSON, like XML. But it's super compact binary message format. It should go really fast over the network because of the size of the message. So it's for high performance. That's why we are going to use it. On the other hand, we have some front-end stuff. We have Phaser. It's basically game development, a kind of game engine for developing in the browser. Uh, we have Reactor GS for the same reason, like pipes and data processing in some clear way. And we have TypeScript because I'm Java developer. I, I like static typing. I like it. That's why I don't like JavaScript. I like TypeScript, but I don't like JavaScript. And of course, we use a protocol buffer as well in order to have everything uh, in the same format. All right, I started with the simplest implementation. I tried to implement all HTTP as my API for communication. You may wonder why, basically. Why should I use HTTP? Because it's plain and simple. It's developed like 20 years ago, and it works by this day. And if you're going to try to implement something on, in your Sprint framework, for example, what you have to do is just implement controller, add a couple of annotations, and magic will happen. So that's all you have to do in order to build your API. Nothing complex, right? So let's take a look whether it's good, is, is good in the same way from the performance perspective. So at this point in time, I'm going to ask you to get your phone, to connect to the network, scan this QR code, or follow this short link. And you will be able to access to this magic page. Let me copy this link. And you would need to put your name, of course. I'm Oleg, so all good. I'm going to start playing, and I'm a host. So let me, find to f let me try to find someone at the map and see whether the performance is good, whether the, the game development is fine. So, yeah, nobody moving. Either nothing happens or... Something went wrong, yeah. It's a little bit shaky, you can see, right? Lagging, jumping from place to place, and it's something we don't want to have at real-time game, right? Do you see that? Do you have the same experience like shaking, lagging, and it's not real, real-time with some lags? Is it like that? Just say it, yeah. It's, a lag. it's definitely lagging. It's not really well-designed for, for real-time games. So let's go back to the slides and let's talk a little bit why all HTTP won't suit for our case. First of all, we have some significant overhead because every message is in text format. So yeah, it's overhead. It's kind of bigger message. A part of that 
this HTTP 1, we had to create a new connection for every request. For this HTTP 1.1, we still have to create a couple of connections and piping all the requests over them, but it's still overhead for our server. server. Our server have to deal with all this connection, play around all this message. So it leads to slow, slower performance. Um, and there is something called communication rigidity. So from, uh, from um, HTTP specification perspective or communi communication protocol, the only way to, to start communicating is to send request and receive response. And there is, there is some hacks on top of that, like server sent event. Have you ever heard about server sent event before? Just a couple of hands. That's the problem. Nobody heard about server sent event. And this is one of the options to create server side streams. But you don't have client side stream yet. So you can't just start streaming over the single connection or single request from browser to server because there is no such API yet. And this is a problem. And a part of that, the most cruel problem is lack of proper flow control. And in order to, to let you understand what flow control means, I'm going to show this picture. And on the left hand is your server, on the right hand is your client. And it just throw all the messages into your face. So yeah, you have to implement different, different patterns in order to deliver all the messages. Of course, you can drop some of the messages, but if it's messages are really important, you have to retry, you have to apply them out because something has happened to your server, it is not respondable, so you, have, you don't have to crash the whole system, you have to time out it, apply some different logic. So it, it, it leads to over-engineering, over in fact. And if you're going to look at the communication, yeah, there is client, there is server, it sends messages, and then your server either have to collect them all and start dropping or crash. That's what could happen to our server. And the answer, of course, to this problem is back pressure. Have you ever heard about back pressure before? Yeah. All right, that's great. So to, to clarify and to remind what is back pressure for those who have never heard, back pressure is a mechanism to send, to say to your server or to your subscriber. So this is basically a publisher here, and this is a subscriber. And subscriber is able by having a mechanism like give me five elements to say, to, to producer how many elements it should exactly produce. And your server gonna pro and your client gonna produce exactly five message. You're gonna consume them and of course you can asynchronously request for more and tune that number as you wish. Basically that idea is implemented behind reactive streams. So this is the main, the, the first implementation of that mechanism in Java. And what you have, you have publisher, subscriber and subscription. And basically the most important that publisher sends subscription to your subscriber and subscriber can control the number of requests that publishers should send over this invocation. This, this is the idea. And we are going to try, find, we are going to try uh, find a protocol which is going to implement that from scratch. So what kind of protocols do we have today? It's clear that HTTP 1 doesn't work. We just check at that. So what else do we have? HTTP 2, yeah, one connection, binary message sending, and yeah, developers say, says that uh, there is back pressure. Apart of that, we have TCP, well-known protocol, works for years, like 40 years since nowadays, and uh, it just works, well-known in game development, so we can use it. Can we? Unfortunately, we can't, because we are doing communication between browser and server, and browser does not, pure, does not support pure TCP connection, so we have to upgrade it a little bit to WebSocket, which is almost the same, the same connection. Of course, we can use some, something more exotic, like Quick or I don't know, any other protocols which is less supported on all, the ki all kind of devices. That's why we are going to stick to, all, to, to, those, to those tools. Uh, it's enough for us. For EDP doesn't work in the browser. Like, or you have to, to, to use something specific which is not supported everywhere in the same, in the same, in the same manner. So that's why I say, it, like, let's stick to that one. All right, how to compare those protocols? This is important. First of all, we have to look um, at something, call it, Maintainability. What does it mean? It means that the developer's experience should be really well. You have to have good documentation. You have to have uh, ability to find something over the, Google, over the Google or Stack Overflow. Because otherwise, if you don't have good documentation, don't have good API, don't have uh, observability over the network, you will going to invest your money of your business into the development, into the solving all of this problem which comes with this development. On the other hand, the important part of, of any any kind of comparison is stability for our case. We are talking about protocols and microservices. Stability means that your service works 20 hours, seven uh, days per week, and whole year without any problems. So it stably works, serves, uh, serves your customers, and brings money for your business. Otherwise, it's just wasting money. And finally, 
it's important to talk about performance. Less money invested into the clouds, less, less money you spend on your kind of machines, the better, the, better, the better business you have. Because you don't want to spend billions and millions of, of dollars per year for your, uh, for your infrastructure. It's a waste of money. It's better to invest for something, so for, for something green. So let's talk about those two protocols. We have WebSocket, we have HTTP, and let's, um, let's start with WebSocket. So basically, why WebSocket? As I said, it's almost the same TCP and overhead. Uh, and it's designed for high performance, a single connection binary communication in both, direction, both, both directions. So why not WebSocket? From my own perspective, if you're gonna try to use pure WebSocket, which means just pure WebSocket connection where you, you have only bytes, you would have to implement your own protocol, which is wasting of money, of course, which is wasting of your development resources. And you would have to maintain it over years, and this is just increase your spends on your development. Of course, there is some existing solution on top of WebSocket. Someone developed that for us. For example, there is SOX.js and Stomp. Have you ever heard about SOX.js and Stomp? Just a couple of hands. The problem right now with Stomp is that the last specification update was in 2010, and the last, the most modern implementation in Java was dated in 2015. So you probably don't want to use that in production at this point in time, and then support if you find some bugs in there. Of course, there is more modern uh, protocols like Socket.io, and let's try to use Socket.io. Basically, why Socket.io? It's the most popular um, communication framework over the web socket for JavaScript. You, got, you can find over 20,000 of stars at GitHub which should say, all right, this is the correct solution for you. In, in turn, it's based on topic communication. It allows you to send binary text messages. And for Java implementation, you can find a server, Socket.io server, built on top of Netty. Have you ever heard about Netty before? Yeah, worked with Netty before? So if you never worked with Netty, it's really high performance, asynchronous, non-blocking server, and the main feature of the server is byte buff. So basically, byte buff is a way to directly, out of your heap, out of all, of all uh, Java nature, access to network card memory to your socket buffer, and without copying this, this data to your memory, to your heap, Manipulate of, of uh, use like manipulate those data and those bytes. So the main idea is to decrease the number of GC cycles because you don't copy any objects in your memory and manipulate everything out of heap in some in some unsafe way. But it leads to really high performance. Does it make sense? All right. So if it if it d does, let's try to to play socket air game and figure out whether it's faster or not. So the link is almost the same. I'm just gonna copy it. You have to see the same, the same page, and yeah, I have to say that I have nothing. Nothing has changed from the implementation perspective. I didn't change anything except new framework for network communication, and for some reason it just doesn't work. Does it work for you? No, and the same problem for me. Yeah, we can try try to restart it. Maybe again. And unfortunately, it's not a my bug. I do, did my best to make it really, really good. But unfortunately, in order to figure out what went wrong, we have to look inside a little bit of our, of our web server built um, for socket IO. First of all, from development perspective and experience, there is no integration with Spring. And as I said, I'm, I already started using Spring because of the popularity of this framework. I have to, to integrate it myself, which means I have to start server myself, and I have to manage the life cycle of the server and try to combine it with Spring. And the main problem is that it is, it is really easy to, to forget something, because it could be all events in Spring life cycle, but I can miss any, something important, for example, with Spring Cloud or something similar, and then I have some continuously running uh, process with some busy or um, some already occupied uh, port, which means I have to, uh, to, 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 to manage it somehow, and this is not the good case for developers. Then the API is really uh, awful, unfortunately. There is no controllers, there is no annotation, there is nothing we really love. There is only lambdas, strings, and that's what we would have to, to deal with, and this is another problem. And finally, the, the main reason why I have chosen this framework is because of Netty and byte buffs. And if you're going to look at this API again, we will see that I don't have, have 
direct access to byte bus, but I have access to byte array, which means I have to copy everything from my byte bus, from my out of heap, and keep it and move it to my heap, which increases the number of objects and uh, the number of GC cycles, which ex actually leads and led to, to that problem that we just saw on the screen, because too many GC cycles. All right. It's worth to say that it's good somewhere. It's good at GS world, but we all Java developers, so it's not suitable for our case. All right. So what else do we have? It's clear that if you're going to develop something on top of pure WebSocket, it would be a challenge. So maybe something else. Maybe let's go to HTTP 2. Do you know anything, like any good framework for HTTP 2? Anyone? No one? No, no framework for HTTP 2? All right, I'm going to help you a little bit. Maybe you heard about gRPC. Do you hear? Did you? All right, that's basically a good framework built on top of HTTP2. And yeah, why gRPC? Built on top of HTTP2, it's really a framework for HTTP2. And if you're going to Google like performance of gRPC versus REST, we will see that gRPC is seven times to ten times faster than, than plain REST, which is win. So what else? Built on top of protobuf, which means you can define your API using proto file and proto, proto API, which means that uh, all you have to do in order to define your kind of communication pattern is, is RPC, define it in proto above, so you can easily say, okay, this is request response and the method is start, and this is, for example, so some, streaming, um, some streaming API, so you can simply say, okay, this is stream of location from your client, and this is stream of players updates from the server, so you can define that uh, on the API level without any problems, like communication patterns. And moreover, you don't have to develop. You don't have to implement yourself all these things. All you have to do is to define a protobuf product plugin. You have to add a couple of things in there, and then it generates everything for you. Magic. That's amazing developer experience. And all you have to do finally is to, to implement your small business logic, add annotation, and it works. Finally, the most important for me as for, for someone who stays behind stability and resilience of the system, Google says that gRPC, like Google RPC framework, is resilient. So if you Google for Google, um, for Google thoughts about reliability of gRPC, you will see that they say that gRPC is really re reliable. And if you're going to go like, uh, under the hood, you will see that there is something called back pressure. That's, that's, that's good. So let's try to use it and let's, let's try to figure out whether it's performant and stable and good for our case. So let's do that. Let me copy this link up. Something wrong. All right, I'm here. You have to see the same page again. And let's try to connect and play. So yeah, food is eatable. I can see that somewhere someone is moving. It's a little bit still shaky. Do you see that, like, okay, someone disappeared at all. But the problem is still the same. So if I'm going to increase the screen size, let me do that, you will see that this is, there is shaky movement, right? Do you see that? Do you see the same as me? Your thoughts, friends. Yeah, a little bit shaky. Yeah, I just caught myself, so it's not good. All right. So let's, let's move to our slides, and let's figure out what's, what's wrong with basic EVS gRPC and why it's still lagging, even so it says that this is high-performance super framework from Google. So basically, uh, why my, my, my web application with gRPC is still, lag, still lagging? In order to figure out, you have to open the console, like browser console, and once you start moving, you will see that there is lots of location request with, for some reason, HTTP 1, and even though it could be HTTP 2, but the problem is clear. If you're going to look at HTTP limitation, even HTTP 1 or HTTP 2, you will figure out that even HTTP 2 specification says that semantic of communication hasn't changed. It. It's not changed. It, it's still request response, and you can't nothing to do with that. Even though you heard about push request and pu server-side push, it's still request response, but with some hack, you still have to send the request in order to get some asynchronous uh, d d deferred push messages. So communication hasn't changed yet, which leads that the only way to start streaming from the client is to say the same request, 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 but the problem is hidden in a different, in, in absolutely different place. If you're going to Google what's wrong with gRPC and why do they don't use, for example, WebSocket, you will figure out that gRPC web 
is, uh, is official gRPC implementation for browser, and it has some gap in, in the architecture. Basically, there is a proxy, and you have to send request response doing normal like REST communication over the proxy, and then the proxy will map all, the, all your requests into, into some normal gRPC server-to-server -server communication. So basically, if we're going to look at our uh, Pacman implementation, we will see that we have Envoy proxy. This is one of the implementation of gRPC for web integration with your Java. And then there is no chance, like there is some chance that it will be upgraded to HTTP2, but it's, it's really uh, hard to make sure that it's happened. Then you have to use the same request response pattern, open redundant connections, and then moreover, in order to create some uh, streaming from the server side, you have to hack it a little bit and then create another couple of connections and listen for updates. So it means that uh, it's not ideal. That's why it's lagging and that's why we have the same overhead as with HTTP. However, you heard that I say it's resilient and it's worked really well on the server side. So maybe we can apply this, this framework for server side development. And especially if gRPC said that they have back pressure, we can apply this for our enterprise pipeline, right? Does it make sense? Yeah, I think it does. So if you're gonna look at the implementation of gRPC for Java, and if you're gonna look at our subscriber API, we will see that we have to implement something like in reactive stream, subscriber or observer. And the observer has this amazing method request five or request 10, or request whatever number of messages we are ready to consume at this point in time. That's what we want to have, right? However, don't, f don't, don't be fooled by Google or implementers of Google, because on the producer side or publisher side, we have this API, which does not specify how many messages we have. And do you see the problem here? Any thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to help you a little bit. Just imagine that this is volatile Boolean. What can happen if someone updating this, the state of this Boolean, like network or netty, at this point in time, and you have already read the flag and it says true, then you can send an additional message, right? Because there is racing. And actually, there is an issue related to back pressure and to this racing, racing condition. And some, someone complaining that it's really easy to, to, to be racy, reading is ready, and then sending the element. And the official response is, yeah, the racing is totally possible. gRPC has can nothing to do with that. And it's obvious that the only guarantee we can get if it's ready field is false, that there is no guarantee that your application has already observed it. So we can close the curtis, make an applause for gRPC, and say that the main problem is that we can oversend a little bit of elements. But yeah, should it be a problem for us? Uh, it shouldn't be, but uh, just imagine the case. What if we have not a single publisher in our app? That's totally possible to have a thousand of simultaneous streams to different recipients. And what if all of them are running at the same app or the same server, and all of them can op may overproduce a couple of elements? So in order to figure out what can happen, let's try to, to, to make a test for our kind of machine learning pipe. And what we're going to test is stability, is back pressure for all the cases. So the first case, everything is good. Our subscriber is really fast. All works pretty well. And then we um, suddenly have a speed decreasement in our final subscriber. And what we have to make sure is that our pipeline is still working because everything is going through this guy. And it's important for us to make sure that it's not going to die. So let's try to run this test. And what can happen, basically, we start our server, it consumes messages. So basically, we send messages, and we consume the same number of messages. So the, the system is in a balance. Then we decrease the speed, and what we can see? We are going to see that for some period of time, because of this racy condition, our producer is going to produce some number of messages, some the same, uh, the same amount of messages, even though our subscriber consuming much less. So in order to understand how it looks on the graphs, um, I'm going to show you some throughput measurement from publisher side and from subscriber side. And of course, it's less visible what's happening. Yeah, I'm going to highlight a little bit. And here is my publisher. Here is my subscriber. At some point in time, back pressure started working. Yeah, but there is some gap between them. So publisher overproduced some messages, whether a subscriber does not consume them. So the question, were all of those 20K messages here. This is actually the measurement of, of memory consumption, and we can see here 
the spike of memory usage. This is out of heat because of Netty. Both like gRPC is built is built on top of Netty as well. And it should be fine if we really have an application. But nowadays, as I said, we are living in cloud native era. We just provide a couple of uh, megabytes to our Docker or um, Kubernetes container, so we have just a limited number of resources. And the next thing that could happen to your app is out of memory. And this is sad. That's something we don't want to have at production. So yeah, gRPC has some kind of back pressure, but it's not ready for, for this real production cases. All right. Let's do some small summary for, for all we heard at this moment in time. Yeah, everything is either slow or hard to implement or like some browser support. Not every one framework support proper back pressures that we want to have for the whole, uh, for the whole our system. And do our business want to solve and invest money in solving all of this problem? The same question were asked five years ago at Netflix. All of you heard about Netflix, right? This is a huge like movie shop as well as good development, uh, like de good developers shop where you can see real innovations. Netflix invented or brought uh, Rx reactive extension to, to Java, so they was innovator in that area, and they started utilizing their, their uh, hardware really well. And what they got into in 2015 is that they tried to utilize gRPC in order to, to improve perform performance of network communication. And in, in, in their cases, they almost have the same uh, the same communication pattern as we, but they have super cool servers which they can control, which they can uh, check how they works. They have like gateway which expose all the services to uh, to outside world for security reasons, and all the devices like your um, your um, mobile phones, TV, PlayStations, whatever devices that can connect to to Netflix, communicating over some streaming over some channel, open channels. And what can happen is obviously devices could start lagging, the network issue could happen, and everything that is going through gateway would start stopping at gateway because of the lack of, of, of because of the lack of proper back pressures that you saw. So what happened to them? gRPC just went with out of memory, went into the into the nothing, and you can read about this and listen to real story from one of the ex developers of Netflix platform. Uh, he is explaining what happened to them and why gRPC didn't work really well. And actually, what they what they started to 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 do is that they started thinking about better solution. They invented they in invested a lot of resources into reactive extension. They invested lots of resources into reactive streams. So they decided let's create the the protocol, the network communication that will solve our problem and will propagate real back pressure as we want. So they created our socket, and that protocol of communication got the name our socket. So you may wonder what our socket, what is our socket? Our socket, basically, from my point of view, is, is a bright future, really. Basically, in a few words, it's implementation of reactive streams as a binary protocol. So there is a framing, there is kind of some specification for, for bytes numbers, which uh, mimic reactive streams um, in Java or any other languages, but over the network. So I don't want to waste your time. Let's try to play it and figure out whether it's better or not. So this is implementation is built on top of, uh, on top of uh, our socket. And let's try to, to, to see whether, yeah, it's better. Do you see no lags, smooth movement? Of course, there is some spike in latency because I'm, I'm working over Wi-Fi. But is it better for those who play in? Yeah, it is. Let me find someone again. Let me find and try to figure out whether it's faster. Yeah, yeah, it's someone. Yeah, it's moving almost without lags. Do you see that ghost? Yeah, there is some weird ghost, but another one are pretty fast. All right, so what makes our socket better? Is it better for you? Yeah, for some it's better. Of course, there is some some bugs. I'm not the ideal JavaScript developer, to be honest. But let's skip it. Let's let's just assume that our socket better. I'm going to explain why. First of all, because it utilizes all the cool feature of all well-known protocol like HTTP/2 and others. For example, is binary, which means that in order to send your data, you have to convert them to to binary format. And then our socket as a protocol take care about delivering all the bytes over the network, and you wouldn't have to 
to, to deal with this binary connection and read bytes and check if that's the end of the connection. All you have to do is to, to send payload, binary payload, receive binary payload. A part of that, there is multiplexing. So you create only a single connection and send all your logical stream over this connection. And you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is, is done by, under the hood by our socket implementation, because our socket is a spec, it's a protocol, remind you. And uh, you have to deal, for example, in Java, you have to create this reactive stream and send it over the library, and you would, ab you would be able to receive the same stream on the other um, end of the connection, and you can receive the same stream here. So that's the idea, to send reactive streams back and forth. Then it's transport agnostic. For me, it's really important. Just imagine that you stick to gRPC. gRPC is built and tightly coupled with HTTP2, and you don't have an option to build gRPC communication over, for example, WebSocket. That's the main problem of gRPC. Protocol is built on top of HTTP2 features, and you, don't, you can't just go away from that. In contrast, our socket is totally transport agnostic. You just define binary protocol, and you can send those binary frames over, over WebSocket or over TCP or over Quick. So you, you are not st stick to, to particular transport. Or even over Aeron, which is UDP upgraded to, to be reliable transport. So you have variety without changing API and all of your communication, your application level. Also, as I said, it's implementation of reactive streams, so you have real back pressure propagation. We have like frame for sending request and message. So you request it in your Java method, for example, subscription request 10, and this will be converted to binary frame sent over the network, and on the opposite side or on the toward side, you will be able to, like, the library will convert it back to, to request N and send this method invocation to your, to your producer, and your producer will be able to send exactly the number of messages were requested over the network. That's the coolest idea. And the final, what, what I want to emphasize attention here is that re th this is real peer-to-peer -peer communication. At the very beginning, there is client and server because someone have to create a connection. Afterwards, both of them are identical in their rights. Both of them can implement controller, can implement some business logic on both sides, and either client can request for some data stream, as well as a server can have an access to outgoing, outgoing connection. It can send requests to your client, and your client can, have, can act as a, as a responder, as a server. That's the, one of the coolest idea. Of course, there is some other notable future like leasing. So basically, this is an idea of circuit breaker implemented inside the network protocol. So you don't have implement anything related to server stability on your own. This is built into, into the protocol. Then resumability. You are dealing with mobile phones, which is disconnecting, connecting to the network, and one of the prob problems you have to continue the stream that you just sent from the server. Instead of implementing this logic for resumability of your stream, starting resending all of the data or having some handshake, this stuff is built in into the protocol, so you have to just implement, uh, not implement, but enable this feature. This is an additional flag in your library and start using resumable streams. So if someone went wrong, you can always continue the session just with, which just uh, got disrupted. And finally, there is fragmentation, so if you send in like huge files, you won't be able, you're not kind of allowed to, to overwhelm the, the data stream or uh, your TCP connection or whatever connection, but, but by your only uh, messages, you will be able to split your, your whole payload into smaller chunks and stream them separately and asynchronously. That's the coolest idea, so let me show you some code in order to, to, to be more closer to just engineers. So let me show you some, some hello world with our socket and let me explain you what you should know about our socket from the developer's perspective. The first, the first thing that you have to, to know about is our socket. Basically, our socket is, is your communication API. Our socket provides you all the communication pattern um, you can use in, in your one connection. So it's not only about streaming, it supports request response, which is almost the most common communication pattern. It, it provides you more kind of uh, advanced communication pattern. It allows you to just send a message and forget about what's happening on the other side and start doing any other work without waiting for response. So this is also useful for sending logs, for example. There is react, uh, request stream, so you request for, for a stream of messages from the server, or you can do kind of bi-directional streaming. And you can send stream of messages this way and receive the stream of messages back way. This is notable features. 
On the other hand, I guess you notice that there is something called payload. So basically, payload is a representation of your binary data. And what you have to know is that there is data. And for Java, it's byte buffs. It's basically built on top of Netty and uses all the future of Netty, so direct access to the network card without copying anything into your, into your application, like zero copying, uh, data sending. And there is something more advanced, advanced which, uh, which every one of us is really required, is metadata. You always want to send some information, some headers, some additional metadata, and it's built in the, into the payload. So you can send it along with any message, like specify my type of this message, etc. This is cool stuff. All right, what else? Part of that, what you have to, to do in order to create your receiver or server, you have to, to use our socket factory. It allows you to create receiver. It allows you to say, okay, this is your copy communication. It allows you to enable resumability just in one uh, method in the builder. It allows you to specify storage, like call the hoard storage for your elements that just been uh, sent during the disruption. So it provides lots of guarantees. You can enable fragmentation and you don't have implement yourself anything. It's built in. There is leasing, so there is lots of cool stuff here. A part of that, you can implement a scepter. Of course, you, you can't go in the server side without any handlers for, for your connection. And in this case, let me expand this lambda. Um, during the connection, you kind of during once client connected to your server, you don't have access to real connection. But instead, you have your connection set up, handshake or payload. This is the first payload that your client sent to your server, so you can identify, identify who is just connected to, to me and what rights does it have, and you can just reject this connection or do whatever you want, as well as you have representation of someone who just connected. So not only you can expose API, as I said, you can do real bi-directional peer-to-peer communication because you can start using this incoming com connection with the same method, uh, with the same number of methods. You can ask for request response, ask for fire and forget, or ask for some stream of data. That's cool part, so it's real peer-to-peer. -peer. On the other hand, you can provide some implementation. There is abstract R-Socket. This is implementation of uh, R-Socket interface, which basically returns to any, to any response an error. So this is the simplest implementation, which allows you to start really fast. And if you want to override some, some business logic, just override request stream, for example. And what you have to do, you have to just return Flux. Flux is basically part of Project Reactor. This is a stream. It's like observable from a Java or just infinite stream of messages. Or you can override like request response and return mono, which is a representation of stream of single element. So you can do whatever you want, basically implement whatever kind of API with just like basic API. And for example, you can return flux of a hundred of messages. A part of that, as I said, you can do peer-to-peer -peer communication. So here I'm going to ask my client for some Bitcoin mining. You can just imagine that you have a browser. You, so your client connected to your application and you say, okay, let's try to, to earn some money from our connection, from our browsers who just connected to us. And let's say, let's ask for, for some Bitcoin mining. Yeah, that's a good like, business investment, you know? You're asking someone to, to, to mine Bitcoin for you. And you can easily do that. I don't know what's happening in Ron, but yeah, basically you can say, okay, I receive, uh, I request, please mine Bitcoin for me, and you expect that someone on, on the opposite side will start doing that for you. On the other hand, let's take a look, for example, at JavaScript implementation. We just seen, we just saw the, uh, the, the, ser the Java server implementation, but you can use actually our socket in any language, almost any language. This is polyglot, uh, polyglot framework. Uh, because this is a specification. So you can create our socket connection over the web socket. You can specify that you want to connect to localhost 8080. You can specify the MIME type of communication. You don't have to implement heartbeat logic in order to make sure that your connection is still alive. This is built in into the protocol. Like this is part of specification, so you don't have to do anything. And then you can say, okay, this is our socket that I got during the connection, so I'm going to ask my server for some data. So let's try to run this guy. Let's try to run our server. Let's try to, to run our um, JavaScript backend and see whether it works or not. This is actually a web browser application which is running on, on, on this port and they have like Sprint Boot application. So let me open the screen. Let me say localhost 8080. And then, okay, let me expand this guy a little bit to make more clear what's going on inside the console because all the action are happening inside the console. So we can see, let me increase the font, 
we can see that I got a connection, I logged that in my JavaScript, and then I got a number of objects as a response. So what happened? On the server side, I'm sending a hundred of messages, but for some reason, I'm receiving only 10. So what happened? Your idea. Actually, back pressure happened, because I have this subscription, and I'm, can, I can send that I want only 10 elements. And I can change this number, for example, to five elements. And it, you will see in a sec that this, yeah, it's recompiling because this is dynamic JavaScript, it can do that. And here we go, I received five elements. I can control it. I can put my subscription somewhere in my, ma in my object and then receive five messages. I can request for another five. This is real back pressure. And what's interesting here is that if we're going to look at the backend side, let's go to look at the backend side. Okay, we will see some errors. That's weird. But basically, here we can see like um, request five. We received request five element and we produced exactly five elements. That's something really we want. We really want like propagation of real back pressure over the network. And then, for example, as I said, we can uh, implement this re response handling. So basically, what we have to do is to say, okay, I want to implement responder logic in my browser. So I can define the same request, response request, stream APIs and method uh, for, for, out, for incoming like request, and I can respond to all the requests that my server sends to me. For example, got payload, yes, I'm going to mine something for you. That's what we have to see in a couple of seconds um, in our server side. So let me restart here, and we can see connected. Yeah, restarted, yeah, connected. Um, what's happening? Something went wrong. So let me make sure I've done everything in the correct way. So please work correctly. Let me restart just in case my backend in order to make sure it works. But in a sec, you will see that it's real peer-to-peer -peer communication and my, uh, my browser should respond with, uh, with, with this message without any problems. So, we start in, yeah, please mine bitcoins. And my browser just respond with a message, yes, I'm gonna mine some for you. Success, successful business at least. All right, let's go back to our slides. It's almost the end. Let me finalize and emphasize the important things here. First of all, of course, we just deal with, we just deal with some pure R socket API, which gives you just payloads. But basically, maybe you want to have some RPC communication, right? As with gRPC. Basically, you can do that. We have R socket RPC core, which provides you with the same API, with the same model of communication as gRPC. You have to set up just additional uh, library to your protocol buffer, and then it will generate the same stops and interfaces as gRPC does. So you don't have to implement this part yourself. Apart from that, if you don't like RPC but you're fan of Spring, there is Spring Messaging. And Spring Messaging just provided Spring Boot Starter, our socket, which allows you to do something like that, define port and host, any transport, and then replace your, for example, Web Flux controller with just few annotations like message mapping. And that's all you have to do in order to start using our socket without changing anything. This is amazing. So that's basically great developer experience because I love it. Like I'm, I'm Spring fan, I have Spring Reactor programming far, uh, fun, and I don't have to change anything. It's out of the box provided for you. So in order to see the whole picture, this is basically about our socket. Most of the land, popular languages, any type of architecture for your API, any message format, even your custom binary protocol, then our socket, and then you don't have to rewrite anything in order to change your transfer. Yeah, I, I, I just missed that part. I don't emphasize this part here. But basically, what you can do, you can switch your transport really easy. There is a method, transport. And you can use WebSocket server transport, as well as TCP server transport, or Aeron server transport, and you can use different clients with different transport for data sending, without changing anything. This is, this is part of the protocol. All right. So what about stress and stability? If you're going to run the same test, you will see that, first of all, the first interaction is requesting. So if you are good, if you are in good condition, you're going to send the first request, like 10 messages, and then it will be delivered to your clients. And only after that, your clients start sending data. So if you are slow, for example, at some point in time, you become slow, 
you are not going to request anything. You will be waiting for, all, for your processing time, whether all good at this point in time. And once you see that nothing is better, you can request less messages. And this number of messages will be delivered to your client, and client just produces the number you requested. So Graph says these numbers, the same condition, the same kind of, the same pattern, everything the same, nobody overproduce messages, which is important for us. All right, to summarize advantages. Simplicity in development, efficient resource usage because single connection binary data mess uh, message sending. High performance, yeah, it's almost the same performance as gRPC, just 5% less because of uh, binary framing overhead. High flexibility in terms of communication patterns and efficient reliability. That's important. So disadvantages. We are developer, we have to know about disadvantage. And the main disadvantage is uh, still under development. The best client is, and, and implementation is our socket Java. The next one is our socket CPP, then our socket GS. We have only our socket client for uh, our socket.net, and we're still developing new and new clients. There is our socket Go, but it's not everywhere, and it's still under development, development and that's not good for us. On the other hand, there is narrow adoption, which means that not many companies is using our socket nowadays. However, I have to say that those who are using is really cool. First one is Netflix. It was developed at Netflix. Then Facebook. Facebook is using, and every one of you who are using Facebook Messenger is using our socket today. Netflix. We are building and supporting all the clients there is today. Pivotal just joined us, and Alibaba is planning to adopt their IoT over our socket. And finally, we created our socket foundation. That's the great movement for, for the popularity of our socket, our socket, the first pro project here. And yeah, finally, we have a foundation. All right, to summarize what we've seen during the whole presentation, this is a final table of comparison of all the protocols, of course. But it's worth to say, it's worth to say that every protocol has its own benefits. You don't have to start using our socket today because it's hype new, shiny thing. But you have to understand your business. You have, for example, Socket.io is good in JavaScript world. gRPC performs really well. But if you want to create reliable and stable system, you have to use something which provides that, like real cloud-native communication protocol. So if you want to learn a little bit more, just follow me and my company at Twitter. We publish lots of material related to our Socket. There is community forum. You can easily ask any question and ask for support related to our socket. There is video channel if you want to learn more about our socket. There is our socket in Spring. Experiment with that. And there is cloud native implementation of our socket with real message brokers and some enterprise school feature that you would need today. Basically, that's it from my side. I'm going to move all the questions on the backstage. So please catch me behind the door and ask everything you want. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day.